Right, well, hello everybody and thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, as I say, unfortunately, Joanne is having uh, internet problems, so uh, is not able to introduce me. So uh, um, I, this is me and I'm here. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm, this afternoon, I'm hoping to cover three separate groups of slides. Um, and these are really, well, in fact, it might be four. Early motoring in Southport. And then we're going to go to the 1903 promenade race, which, uh, uh, which was when many of the motoring pioneers came to race down our promenade. And that's quite an interesting uh, time. And then uh, I'm going to uh, cover some 1911 St. John slides, which were brought into the Atkinson some years ago. And I scanned them uh, about 18 months ago. If we have time, I've actually got a, a miscellaneous set of slides uh, which we'll uh, which we'll go on to. Certainly, I think we will get into those, but possibly not cover them all. But we'll just see how 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 we go for time. So we're going to start uh, with the early motoring in Southport, and um, Southport's love of the motor car goes right back to the dawn of motoring, and the Atkinson has a number of images that portray this. The following images tell that story, and I've managed to unwind a few of the tales that lie behind these early images. The first person in Southport to actually manufacture a car was Felix Hudster, Hudless in around about 1896. And it was reported that he made every part of the car in his workshop. And this is uh, Hudless with his number one car in, um, uh, outside his workshop. Uh, Felix only managed to manufacture around 20 cars, and this is the first car he produced, photographed in his yard, uh, in Ivy Street. His workshop was below the row of shops on Hart Street, just up from the Blue Anchor pub, so that gives you some idea. And in fact, the, uh, the uh, Mr Barrett, who now owns this property, uh, was totally confused by this picture. And then he realised, in fact, that, it, it, that the top story has been taken off. But, uh, but he was able to identify it then as being the, the same building. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, Hudless uh, family and Felix is on the far right. Um, he sold out in about 1902 to a Dr. Barrett, a local physician and surgeon who lived in Park Avenue. I've not really been able to understand why that was other than Barrett, as I will explain shortly, was uh, very much interested in early motoring. But I would like to quote the following letter written by Felix, Felix in the 1940s about his early car business. This may be the reason he decided to sell his business. He asked a, a, a local wealthy cotton spinner for finance, but he turned him down with the following statement. Hudless, I think I can claim to be a successful businessman and I've had greater experience than you and would willingly find all the money you want if I could see any prospect of a return but I can see no future for the motor car. And I would advise you not to put any more money and time into this business. So there you are folks, no future for the motor car. Maybe due to this advice, Hudless around 1902 sold the business to Dr. Barrett, uh, who retained Mr. F.W. Fiddy as his mechanic, although the name had changed to Bar Car. So in fact, it started at Hudless Motor Company, it went to the Phoenix Motor Company, and I only discovered yesterday whilst researching that in fact, uh, he did have a fire, which I think was one of the reasons why he sold out uh, to Dr. Barrett. Uh, he was having one of the cars uh, built with a body in a coach builders and it got on fire. The coach builders got on fire. He lost uh, all, all the car and everything. And, and, and therefore I think was disheartened. Uh, but obviously he did come back in some form because it was known as the Phoenix Motor Company when it was sold to Dr. Barrett. Uh, so, uh, sorry, Felix left the town and he went to work for the RAC. The following three images, or three or four images, um, state a date, date of 1897, as you can see on the screen here. But uh, they could be a couple of years later than this, maybe 1899. And I was really delighted when these popped up, um, when John uh, dug them out of the, um, the recesses of the, uh, of the storeroom. Uh, because they are an absolute gem and uh, they continue to provide me with a lot of fun because identifying the makes and models and things like that has been really the last, um, uh, it's really taken me the last couple of years to do. And in fact, they're only really coming out of, um, out of the woodwork now. This car on the left hand side, funnily enough, had only discovered um, below the Dr. Barrett sign, uh, which uh, he, he's the fellow with the, 
with the top hat. But the fellow below him um, in that car there, that's actually a French car sold by Marshalls. I only discovered it. And they're very, very rare. Um, so this first image is a group um, of three and four wheel cars with several names scribbled on the top. And I've managed to decipher some of these names. Uh, and in this next photograph, I'll, I'll, uh, I, I've put them at top of the slide. So there's um, uh, Mr. William Henry Barrett, physician and surgeon who bought Barrett's business, Leonard Williamson, who's the young man uh, where, the, where the arrow is pointing down towards. And then there's Forbes Frederick, uh, For, Forbes Frederick Edward, uh, who was a machinist from King Street. And he was also an electrical engineer. I've seen that uh, mentioned as well. Um, and from these uh, names, these three names come out uh, quite a lot, in particular Leonard Williamson's. And this photo was taken in his back garden. Uh, Leonard Williamson's house, Barwick, was on the corner of Albert Road and Leyland Road. Now, this other photograph, there were three of these photographs. Uh, I'll show you the other one shortly. But if you look at this, this is, again, the same group, taken, I think, on the same day. Um, Leonard is third from the left on the top row, a young man there. And just behind him is his engineering workshop. And I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment. But if you look up on the right hand side below the at Southport Early Inn, below the inn, you can see, I'll point with the, the thing, you'll see something there. And in fact, that is actually the Imperial Hotel. Uh, so that is where his, uh, his house was. And this photograph was taken looking out on the Imperial Hotel. So this is uh, the man himself. Uh, I was lucky to be sent an article by Leonard Williamson by a friend of mine. His family's wealth came from the Williamsons of Lancaster, who were oil cloth and linoleum manufacturers. Leonard's uncle was James Williamson, better known as Lord Ashton, who became a Liberal MP. If you travel north on the M6 from Preston, you pass a monument just after Lancaster South exit. It's a massive dome on the top of a hill and was built by Lord Ashton. It's a bit of a folly, really. And it's a monument to his late wife. Um, I also was given a, a, an article um, from the Car Illustrated from 1902. So this is very much in and around this same period when Leonard would only be 25 and he was described as an engineer who has a full engineering workshop in his back garden and a test track to allow him to test and compare his cars. And if you look on that um, particular uh, road, uh, on, um, uh, on the, the road that um, the Imperial, uh, Imperial Hotel is on, you will see that there are a lot of new houses and they were built on the site that his house Barwick was built on. Uh, this is the, his workshop, um, well supplied with a, a bandsaw on the right hand side, some kind of a, a machine on the left here, all the overhead belting and everything like that, and the lathe at the, at the back. And then there is the engine room, which provided the electricity as well. Uh, a really comprehensive workshop. Um, he trained in Liverpool, in the Li Liverpool Council uh, offices or the uh, workshops as an engineer. So he, so he was a, a knowledgeable engineer as well. Here he is on his former horsepower Oldsmobile with his dog, which appears on a couple of the shots. And in the background, you can see his house on the left and his engineering workshop on the right. Here is a, another picture from that same article outside his house and several photographs were taken and I'll show you a couple more cars of his. He had the most amazing collection of cars. Uh, this is a Daimler, 24 horsepower Daimler. Uh, and again, the dog uh, sat up there um, uh, now, then there were two SPAs. This is the first one. This was sent to me by a friend, uh, John Warburton, who sadly passed away uh, uh, last year. But um, it's an amazing car. I think it's around about circa 1908. We weren't absolutely certain. It doesn't have any registration plates, which is a bit surprising. But maybe this is when it was delivered. But what a fabulous car. Uh, and then this one from my, my collection, my father's collection, actually. And why my dad had it, I have no idea. Again, he's a little bit older. <clears throat> I think the car is about 1908, like the other one, maybe a little later, certainly pre-First World War, uh, with the acetylene lights, massive acetylene lights, and uh, uh, the quality of this image is absolutely stunning, absolutely terrific. Um, and then this is the car that he raced in the 1903 Promenade Sprint, which I'll talk about next. Uh, but back to those very early photographs, uh, and this one in particular, 
this is the third photo of the early meeting, uh, early meeting uh, in Leonard's back garden. And two of the cars at the back have always been a mystery to me. This car here and this car here. And in fact, you can actually too, see two fairly young children in the, uh, in the front through the window of that car. Um, uh, um, mystery to me. I was given a version of this talk over in Preston a few years ago. And when this image, image popped up on the screen, a gentleman in the audience said, that was my car, pointing to the car on the left-hand side. Uh, this is this one here. Uh, at the back. It turned out that this car, an early 1890s Daimler, uh, seen here on the left, um, had been owned by his grandfather and had only been sold out of the family in the 1960s. Uh, I think his name was Ewart Bradshaw and he ran a, um, a car company in Blackpool. Uh, as you can see, this 1950s photo is maybe, maybe 1958, 5960, because there's a herald there, so I'm not sure what year they were produced but that gives you some idea now this has got a very interesting history because here it is on the left uh, at this very early meeting in the 1890s and uh, and there it is in the 60s and actually between that time it was actually owned by Lordy Lonsdale of um, of uh, Lonsdale belt boxing fame so that's quite interesting and I think it must, may have been bought by Ewart's grandfather from that estate uh, it's now in the Schlumpf Museum at France. They sold it uh, into the Schlumpf Museum in France. And it's a, it's a very interesting car. Um, the interesting thing about it is the body, uh, because it doesn't look anything like any other Daimler apart from the bonnet. Uh, it was actually made in Southport by Eddie, Ed, sorry, Edwin Jesse Hart, who was operating at this time in Shakespeare Street in the town. Obviously, it must have produced at least two of these bodies, as these two cars at the back, are of a rather unusual design. It's rear entrance um, in the style of a carriage. And obviously Edwin must have made carriages before he went into this style of, uh, of building. Uh, note uh, how these cars are arranged in mirror fashion. So the two Daimlers are together. Uh, and then if you come to the front of the photograph, this one on the left and this one on the right, and then one, two, three, four, um, they're not tri cars, they are actually um, four wheel cars, but you know, they're front seat, front seating, front seated cars. Uh, now, I have a feeling that these one, two, three, four are locomobiles. I'm not absolutely certain, but there is a, a good reason for that. We think also the one uh, on the right here is a Daimler. I'm not sure about the one on the left here. And this is the very unusual French. Herter, I think it was called, or H-U-T-A or something like that, designed, sold through Marshalls um, over in Cambridge. So quite an unusual car. And here we are is with a very young Leonard Williamson, uh, 19. Um, but to return to Huddler, shortly after he made his first car, a number of other car makers started up in the town. And I can count for about, I can account for about 10 car makers in the pre-1905 pre period. And I'm sure many of them are in this early photo, but we just don't know who they are. Making their own cars or tricycles, and most of these have be previously been cycle manufacturers. As well as this, there were at least seven coach builders who were transferring their skills from the construction of horse-drawn carriages to the horseless variety. Uh, this is another of uh, Leonard's cars, a London Edinburgh Rolls-Royce chassis fitted with a body made by the local car maker Vulcan. I'm not particularly going to cover uh, much about Vulcan tonight, uh, today, sorry, to, but uh, I just thought I'd show you this photo and I have got some uh, more slides um, on a, a particular aspect of, of Vulcans. Unusual that he, that he get uh, a Rolls Royce with a Vulcan body and it's the only photograph I've ever seen uh, of this particular car. Um, at those early meetings um, of the Southport Automobilist, um, Dr. Barrett is in the photos, the guy who bought the business of Hudless. Uh, I have a feeling that possibly Dr. Barrett bought it for his son, who was an engineer, but he seemed very young when, um, uh, when he bought it in 1902. So I'm not absolutely certain about that, but certainly uh, Dr. Barrett's son went on to be an engineer. Uh, in, here he is in an early photograph, again, I think in a Daimler, um, along with his family. And I think the photo is taken around about 1900. Sadly, Dr. Barrett was to lose his life in 1924 
when he fell from his yacht Muriel and in Le Havre Harbour. In this page of the 1903 Promenade Sprint, Dr. Barrett is entering his six horsepower Phoenix. So obviously uh, he then owned the company and the company was still called the Phoenix um, uh, Car Company. And it was being driven by F.W. Fiddy. Another of Southport's early automobiles was um, Frank Huff. And we have a lot to thank Frank, Frank for, because for some reason, a lot of his material ended up in the Atkinson. This uh, advert uh, for his, uh, he, he, he sold invalid hand propelled tricycles and, uh, you know, for, for invalids generally. Um, and then we came across this photo and also this photo. And he actually operated from Sussex Road, 60 Sussex Road. And if you look up here on the right hand side, it actually says Frederick Villas. So there we are. There's the Frederick Villas. And that sign is still on the house, which has now been turned back into a house uh, in, in, in Sussex Road. But uh, he, he was an amazing guy and uh, really grateful. He, the Atkinson actually have a copy of his programme, the programme he actually has made notes on which is rather ni nice and you will see a couple of shots from that when I go to the next section the 1903 uh, race. There are also two other names that I'll mention before going on to the prom race and these are Bell uh, and the better known Vulcan. Charles Edward Bell operated from Tulka Street along with his son Charles. Now he's not necessarily a car maker but certainly sold early cars uh, in Southport and that's the reason that uh, I think those cars in the original photograph I showed you were locomobiles because these here on the left hand side were all locomobiles. Some of them steam driven. These two here and this one and possibly even this one uh, were, were steam driven. And you notice here it says CE Bell um, cycle and motor. So he obviously had transitioned from cycle manufacturer uh, into selling motor cars. Um, but. Uh, this is Charles, but when we move to this other photograph again in, from the Atkinson, it's H. Bell. And uh, I've discovered that, in fact, Charles died in 1900 and his uh, son Harold took over. So this is Harold's era. So obviously there's a little bit of a date difference between those two photos. Now, I sent this photo to um, John Warburton, uh, who was an expert on, on this sort of era of car and the car closest to us. Um, is uh, thought to be a 60 horsepower Mercedes, the supercar of the day, a fabulous car. And um, there were several of these competing in the 1903 race. So I think it's from that period, but uh, not sure of the identity. There is a registration which you can't quite read uh, on the radiator. So, um, so that's quite interesting. And then just a close up of those locomobiles. Um, Interesting in this photograph, obviously there was something on the left that the, photo, that the photographer didn't want to take. So he's uh, completely blanked it off <laughs> with a white sheet. I haven't done that. <laughs> right. So then we move on to, um, to Vulcan. And here is the, what I like to call little and large of Vulcan in the early years. Again, early 1900s, possibly 1910, 1908, something like that. They were one of the largest car manufacturers in the country in the pre-World War I period and were owned by the local Hanson family. And here are two cars, the small and the largest models outside their home in Grange Road. And there's quite a lot of material in the Atkinson about the Hansons, including birth certificates and a few postcards and things like that. This is another Vulcan. I think that's the front of, of the, the, the one closest to us with the young man in possibly even taken on the same day. Um, and I'm pretty certain that that is actually the young, one of the young um, Hanson, uh, Ham, Ham, Hampson sons. Um, then we move on to Tommy Rimmer. This is Tommy Rimmer in a Vulcan uh, and it's actually an, a postcard sent back to his mother in 1907 when he competed in the tourist trophy in the Isle of Man. Um, and this car appeared again. Uh, this was sent again by John Warburton. It's not in the Atkinson collection but he sent it me and it's this one here and in fact it's a picture taken in the back streets of Southport somewhere but that's Tommy, the same same guy. You can see his face there, see his face there. Not sure who the other guy is. FY68, so, uh, uh, but it's exactly the same car. And then just another picture of the Vulcan factory. I'm pretty sure this is 
There is a date for this photo, but I'm pretty sure it's pre, pre World War I, so that gives you some idea. But in 1911, the Hampson family took a continental tour in one of their cars, no doubt for pub publicity purposes. I'd love to have that publicity if we if we manage to get a hold of it. You never know, it might turn up. And in the Atkinson is an album of photos that cover this tour, and they really did a get around. Here they are shipping the car uh, from the UK across to the continent. I'm not sure whether it's this side or that side. Um, this photograph was taken at the top of uh, Mount uh, Sinise, 7,400 feet up. Uh, so it's done pretty well because that's between France and um, uh, and Italy. It's a it's a pass, an Alpine pass. So uh, it's not done badly to get that far. Bearing in mind this is 1911, <clears throat> and then we have um, entrance of St Peter's Cathedral, um, or as what we would know the Vatican. Uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Peter's Square. And uh, another photo of St. Peter's Square, which is with one car there and hardly anybody around at all. Quite amazing, quite incredible. And then quite a lot of other photos. Um, I've only included a few of them in this talk. Taking refreshments at Mentone before going into Italy. Then they visited Pompeii. Look at this. Gosh, I mean, if you if you go today, I mean, perhaps not at the moment in COVID times, but if you went um, a couple of years ago, it would have been uh, absolutely packed. Uh, and I went around there, a fantastic experience. But there were thousands and thousands of people. Then a cathedral in Milan. Uh, always get the car in. That's the main thing. Get the car in. <laughs> and then Geneva, Lake Geneva. Amazing. And then this fascinated me, anchored boats in the River Po with paddle wheel in the centre, which works works against the well with the stream and grinds the corn. So I've just blown that up a little bit. And you can see the paddle wheels here. Uh, uh, sorry, let's go back to that. See the, uh, flip, sorry, the minute I touch the mouse. It, so here we are, there's the paddle wheel. And no, I'm not gonna, it's not gonna work, is it? <laughs> it's not typical. There's the paddle wheel and there's the other paddle wheel. Not quite sure what EC stands for, but uh, you know, this could be, uh, you know, 100 years prior to that, really, because the, the technology for that sort of stuff existed at, at that time, but, but quite an, in, an ingenious way to grind corn. And then um, they obviously got up Mount Vesuvius on this tram and they certainly got around, uh, did I say 1911? Yeah, it is 1911, I think. Uh, this was an amazing achievement for a car of that period. Then we come back home and... This I thought was a slightly later car, but in fact it isn't. It's actually dated on the back. I think, uh, no, I thought I'd got the, uh, the, the um, slide of it from the back of it, but it says pre-World War I, uh, and there are the Hamsons and some relation, relations in the back there. Um, uh, and again, I'm not just sure. I don't, I guess I think it was a Vulcan, that's right, yeah. And then we move on to slightly later period. It came across two photos, this one and another one. Uh, and they're not necessarily, well, they aren't v Vulcans, but they've got FY registrations and they're Lee Francis's and they are doing some testing at uh, Brooklyn. So um, Lee Francis is made in the factory here in Southport. Um, but uh, in fact, they had an arrangement with Lee Francis to make a number of uh, cars and, um, and another picture of uh, all these FY registered cars. It's a long way to go to take the, um, the cars down there to do to do the testing, but uh, uh, very interesting. Now this is, um, just a minute, let me think about this. Uh, oh yeah, so this image is actually, oh yes, yeah, sorry, that's right. I was just trying to understand what my notes meant, but I realize now. Uh, I actually had a photo, I had a copy of this photograph, an original copy of this photograph, which I lent to the Scaresby could tell about 15 years ago, 20 years ago from my father's collection for them to copy because they didn't have a copy. The only problem is they lost it, uh, which was very galling. But anyway, the Atkinson do have a copy and it's Frank Hoff's copy. And it was the first motor meet in Southport in 1903. And a lot of those cars that were on those early photographs are noted along with a lot of other people. And just blown it up a little bit to get some idea of uh, some of the detail. It's a fabulous photograph and the quality is really, really good. Um, so here we are, lots of young lads. Amazing. I'm not just sure what some of these uh, cars are. Uh, I'm not particularly good on on early uh, early cars of this period. 
um, but just gives you some idea. Terrific photo. Obviously, a, a few motorbikes as well, or powered cycles, I think, would be the, the description of them. <clears throat> and then just to, to finish with, um, in this section, is a picture of the round hill um, with a, a, a motor bus going past. <laughs> a very early photograph. I'm not quite sure what the period, but 1920s, almost certainly. All right, just a second. And then we go to the promenade sprint. So as you see, Southport had a, an early start with both car makers and early automobiles. Um, the people there to buy the cars and also to invest in the business. But let's wind the back, clock back to 1903, when in October of that year, the local branch of the quaintly named Self-Propelled Traffic Association held the first speed trial along the Marine Parade at Southport over two days, assisted by the Southport Motor Club. And here we see the promenade. Um, I like to think, think of it as Southport's attempt to extend its season as Black Bull does with the illuminations, but unfortunately it didn't catch on. So here we are, there's two guys, um, one, one here and one here. They've been set off and uh, they're just about at the end of their run here. And, and this guy is way in front of the other fellow. Uh, and another picture. There are not any really good quality photographs uh, of of the event uh, that I've come across yet anyway. But uh, but these are the ones that I've managed to cull from, mainly from Autocar, actually, which is quite interesting. So this is, again, from Autocar. Um, the event was a one kilo sprint held over two days, which being speed trials were timed with two cars at, at, at once racing against the, the clock. The Southport Corporation were keen to promote the event and set about removing drinking fountains, curb stones and lampposts to straighten the course and level the road to facilitate easy running for the competitors. Uh, I'm sure they'd be delighted to do that again if we decided to have another one. Uh -huh. uh, but Mr. Albert Stevenson, the proprietor of the Southport Visitor, was the first president of the Southport Automobile Club and had a big involvement in these speed trials and the post-World War I beach racing. The next two slides show the course they raced along. The start was just before the promenade. So there we are. We've got looking north and looking south. I think this is taken from the top of the uh, Victoria Baths, looking looking back to the to the um, finish line. Uh, so it, it, they actually the start was just before the promenade hospital, and the finish was on this on Scaresbrick Avenue. So just about where that that black spot is there is 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 round about it's round about here that the that the finish line would be. Um, and then the cars just returned via Duke Street, Lord Street, and back to the marshalling area, just by the municipal golf links. This is the uh, the map from Frank Huff's uh, program of um, of the event. So here we are. We're we're we're, we're, we're getting uh, 300 yards to get up speed. The start one kilometer, and by the Victoria Hotel, uh, and then 450 yards to slow down, and then returned by Lord Street to uh, to the to the promenade so that's uh, another map showing the uh, showing the course so that gives you some idea and then this is uh, Frank's Frank Huff's copy of the official program of the motor speed trials and I was really pleased about this because it's given us a uh, an amazing view of this event uh, and it, it, it really is it was really quite a quite an amazing um oh yes i did i won't show you those because you've seen that already <clears throat> but uh here we are um the phoenix motor company mr barrett obviously sole agents in southport for carberine and they were supplied and used by mercedes cars and the gordon bennett races um just trying to find my notes at the moment um where are we if you look on the right hand side here we'll be talking about some of these these people so many names that uh, you will you will know. Rolls of Rolls Royce for, uh, for, uh, fame. Andrew Fletcher was very well known. Uh, you've got Herbert Austin, who made the Austin, who started the Austin Company. S.F. Edge, um, Talbot Clifton. You know all these big big names of motoring who were there at this at this big event uh, with some monstrous cars. I mean, look at this: sixty horsepower Mercedes, a seventy horsepower. Um, uh, Panhard and Amores. 
Right, so here we are. Here's um, uh, Fiddy with his um, with his Phoenix and J.S. Newton entered by Thomas Hampson in the Vulcan. So we were represented in a Vulcan. Uh, oh, number 12, that's helpful. I've lost the numbers. <laughs> uh, many Southport uh, residents will remember Bambus, who traded from Burtdale Village and had several showrooms around the town. They also advertised in the programme and they started manufacturing cycles out of town and came to Southport in the late 1880s uh, and their business flourished and they moved into selling both motorcycles and motor cars. In my youth, they were trading in Burtdale Village from the property now occupied the Italian, by the Italian restaurant Villaggio and in the program as well. Uh, so here we are uh, with some of the, the names, as I just mentioned, and uh, they, they'd driven in the Gordon Bennett races and CS Rolls Rolls Royce also brought along his seven, 70 horsepower moors, which he'd recently raced in Dublin. And the uh, Starport deputy, I think he's actually the mayor, Leonard Williamson, entered his 16 horsepower and I think his 20 horsepower Lanchester. So there were a lot of um, interesting cars at the event. Uh, so here we are. Uh, a picture of the sort of just after the start, around about the start at the end of the Marine Lake there. Uh, and another one um, looking up towards the Royal Hotel um, with, I think the car's coming back down the other way. I don't think it's coming, it's coming towards us, that isn't it? So, so here is SF Edge in his Napier, not at the event, but um, I didn't have a picture of him, but uh, this is uh, from the internet. And CS rolls in his Moore's car. Um, let me just find the notes uh, about that. Um, back to the piece. The track was laid out on the promenade with cars racing the north to south. I've mentioned that, haven't I? Uh, the, the local paper heralded a world record as 198 competitors comprising of 60 motor cars, uh, 90 tourist cars, 30 racing cars and a few motorcycles. The hotels were quick to cash in on the event. Uh, that, although there's Leonard in his uh, 16 horsepower Lanchester, and uh, on the um, starting grid, and um, Mr. McDonald in his 20 horsepower Napier. So the hotels were quick to cash in on the event. The Royal Hotel, which was in a prime position on the promenade, advertised windows that afford a view of the whole course from start to finish and seats for two days, including luncheon, for 15 shillings. If your pocket could not stretch to the 15 shillings, just up the road, the public baths advertise a seat for each day for two shillings and sixpence. So you pay your money and you take your choice. Uh, they certainly uh, made hay while the sun shone. It's recorded that Dorothy Levitt, <coughs> driving a gladiator, entered by SF Edge, won Class G. And this was for cars costing £400 and not more than 500 but to carry four people. And this is Dorothy. The story goes that Selwyn Edge, a director of the Napier Car Company and famous racing driver, spotted Miss Dorothy Levitt among his staff, a beautiful secretary with long legs and eyes like pools. In a bid to promote his car, Edge decided that she should take part in a race, though first he had to teach her to drive. She surpassed his expectation by winning her class in the 1903 Southport Speed Trial and proved such a good driver that she was taken on by Didion for a major publicity stunt driving a car from London to Liverpool back in 1906. And here she is in the, uh, um, in, in the reliability trial in 1906. Um, and here she is in the Gladiator number 96, um, a 12 horsepower Gladiator. Uh, Miss Dorothy Levitt. Funny enough, gladiators just seem to disappear uh, on the scene very shortly um, after their initial dominance of the market in this in this period. I don't know of any any um, uh, post World War One gladiators, but I may be wrong. Uh, number twenty four. Uh, she then went to Brighton. She completed in the thousand mile trial. Then she went to Brighton. And she recorded a speed of 79.9 miles an hour in the Brighton Speed Trial, but also broke the woman's world speed record for the flying kilometre in 1906, recording a speed of 90 mile an hour in a trial at Blackpool. And for this, she received the nickname of the fastest girl on earth. 
So that's quite an amusing uh, uh, title. Um, Oh, yes, this is a page from the 1903 programme showing Q-Class. This was sponsored by the then mayor, T.T.L. Scaresbrick. So, so it wasn't, uh, so, so what's the name was the deputy mayor, who lived out at Greaves Hall. All the cars in this class had enormous engines, some of them uh, up to 70 horsepower. I think all of you who ride two-wheel motorcycles should note the following in the race report for the visitor of a dated um, October 1903. Uh, a feature of D-class motorcycles is that one or two motorcycles with two cylinders have entered, entered. Great interest will be taken in their performance, as it is uncertain whether the principle is a good one or not. In nearly all previous competitions for motorcycles, these have been debarred. So they, they, I think they thought it was cheating, basically, to have two cylinders on your motorbike. The fastest time recorded on the day was Mr Higginbottom in his 60 horsepower Mercedes. And here he is. Um, driving over the course and it was 68 miles an hour it was a pretty foul day I think um, which was uh, which didn't help the uh, the running C.S. Rolls came to the event and this was before his tie up with Rolls Royce and before he started the uh, his own company he came in a massive car an 80 horsepower Moors which he'd been racing earlier that year in Phoenix Park and in Dublin he'd managed to set a land speed record of 93 miles an hour in the car but although he spent two nights trying to get the car to run properly, he could only get it to run at half speed, and this was not good enough to set the record. Mr. Woolsey and Mr. Uh, and, and, and Herbert Austin came to the event. Mr. Austin was then working for Mr. Herbert and drove one of his light cars. Herbert Austin worked for him for a couple of years longer and then went off to start his own company. That became the famous Austin Motor Company. Obviously, Woolsey had already been established, and he did sheep shearing engines, and then later on, uh, cars. Uh, and the last few uh, slides in this section are photographs from the Atkinson uh, and an autoca report from the autocar report of the um, of the event. Andrew Fletcher in his 60 horsepower Mercedes. Um, amazing photos. Right, so we're now going to move on to a totally different subject, uh, the St. John's Birkdale glass slides. Um, about three years ago, uh, somebody brought in some slides to the Atkinson. It would be really nice to know who it was because they didn't leave any contacting details. Uh, and there was about 52 slides and they were donated to the Atkinson and relate to the St. John's Birkdale covering the period 1911 to 1915. And I love a challenge like this because you can sort of look into it and research it a little bit and uh, hopefully we do have some John's some, some St John's Birkdale people who join us today to to look at these slides for the first time um, <clears throat> they were taken with a uh, the following two photos I'm not sure whether they're all taken with, with a brownie camera bought at St John's rummage sale for six months heats to inspiring photographers visit the rummage sale <coughs> well, I think possibly uh, these weren't taken with um, with this camera because they are in fact glass negatives Excuse me, I'll just uh, have a little drink there. Um, so this is the interior of the church in 1911. Um, I think it has changed a little since then, but not dramatically. Uh, and then the Harvest Festival of 1911. And the choir and choir master. Uh, and uh, wow, what a massive choir. It's pretty, uh, pretty large, that. And then there were some individuals where I, I was able to identify it. Uh, and others that are, that I that I that I couldn't. Um, some had them written on the slides. Some didn't. This is the Neville Neville Burton, the Reverend Neville Burton, and another gentleman on the right hand side who I don't know the name of. Um, and then F. W. Cross and a, another gentleman on the right that I don't know. And then F. W. Jackson and C. H. Taylor. Uh, uh, I've I, uh, sorry, Miss um, Ellen Maud Burton. I'm not certain that this is her. But she was a very large benefactor to St. John's and laid the foundation stone and provided a lot of the money for uh, for the church. So whether it's her or not, I'm not sure. I've actually compared this with a photograph of her and uh, it, 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 did, it did look like her, but I'm not absolutely certain. Then there's a pony and trap. Now, where this is, um, I really don't know. It's pretty certain it's not Southport. 
because there's not many three-story buildings uh, in in uh, Southport like that, although obviously they could have been knocked down. But I really like this guy. Here's a guy. Uh, oh, sorry. Here's a guy hitching a lift in this um, in this pony and trap, and it's just so ambient. the The photograph is lovely. It's beautifully set up, uh, and this hinging down section, I suppose that. He puts his feet on. How the dickens you get up there? I suppose there's a foot thing underneath, isn't it? It's quite a, a long way up to <coughs> to uh, to get up there. But anyway, amazing. Then St John Schoolbertdell. St John Schoolbertdell at this time in 1911 was in fact uh, called that, but it had been called St James's because before St John's was built, the school existed and it was known as St James's. Once it became in the St John's parish, it changed its name to St John's Burtdell. And then this is. Um, this is number 12, isn't it? Uh, St. John's uh, School Empire Day. Um, I can't read the slide at the top because I've got something, <laughs> something covering it. Um, 1913, we think. <coughs> and you can see Canada over here on the left. And you can just, I'm not sure what that says. BIA Arabia, possibly. Tasmania, um, New Zealand. Uh, you know, quite a lot of, uh, of what was the empire... Uh, countries in those days and this gentleman on the right hand side appears in a couple of these shots looking over the wall which quite amused me then empire day in 1915 although uh, there he is again so whether it's right that one's 1915 and one's 1913 I, i'm not sure uh he must have been very nosy if he uh let's have a look yeah no it's just a different guy i think uh but i, I just think the kids look absolutely fabulous <laughs> all dressed up in their kit not quite sure what this young man's got. Uh, so he's got his scouting hat on and his um, and his uh, Boy Scouts uh, scarf and and toggle, but uh, not quite. He's, he's I think he's holding a sheep or something like that. Um, if you've got any ideas, just put it on the uh, notes and we'll have a chat afterwards. And then there's this young girl uh, in in the uh, left of middle with an elephant in her hand, and this person with something that looks like a fish. Is it? I don't know, amazing, and a wand of some kind here. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of significance in, uh, in, these, uh, in these photographs. And then another one uh, with the older children, I suppose, here, or some of the older children. Um, again, Australia, India, you've got there, and Canada, and I'm not sure. So South Africa, that, that was over there. Then just a blow up of, um, of a couple of sections of this, uh, this photograph not quite sure what these young ladies over on the right hand side are but uh, i'm sure somebody will know and then this uh, uh girl i think this is lovely this with this boy with his uh, cap at an angle it's fabulous isn't it really great they're lovely photos and then st john scouts um I, I love the gear look at the guy on the right hand side it's just amazing absolutely amazing um and then uh I had to unwind this quite considerably because <clears throat> there was no information on it at all as to what this was. Here was a gathering outside some building, but I wasn't quite sure what the building was or what the event was. And the vicar's there and obviously lots of um, lots of parishioners and uh, you know, the great and the good in all their finery. But in fact, I managed to discover that it was an event held on the 16th, 17th of 18th of October in 1913. And it was to raise £500 to be used for the following purposes. £300 for a curacy fund, £50 to be drawn down for six years at £80 um, a year, and then £100 for providing an electric blower for the organ. I suppose that up to then it was manually uh, um, operated. And in fact, the event was actually held uh, in the Carnegie Hall, Birkdale. And many of you will remember that building. Um, I haven't actually provided a photograph uh, separately, but it was by the town hall, sandwiched between the police station and the town hall. And it was uh, also um, where the library was. And there's quite a lot of information there. Um, and there was a cafe chantant, which I'll show you a picture of. And the stalls will bear the following designations. And we'll go through a few of those stalls, the ones that were photographed at the time. Here's the Chantant Café, Singing Café, um, and here are, the, uh, here are the girls serving the refreshments. I imagine this is where they, they were serving them from. They look all very stern. Oh, oh the, and then on the right-hand side is the old woman's shoe. I've got a better picture of that. 
uh, here we are. Here's the old woman's shoe. How lovely. <laughs> oh, really amazing. 1913. Um, and then this, I think, is along the lines of providing something of the Orient, but I'm not quite sure what it is, the sort of uh, idea and concepts of uh, Arabia and, and, and the Far East. But uh, if anybody else has got some comments, please put it on the, uh, on the chat and we'll, uh, and we'll discuss that afterwards. And then uh, there were a lot of slides that took us away from Southport, obviously on trips that, uh, that different groups went to. And this is the Palm House Sefton Park uh, in those days and Levens Hall. I couldn't identify this, but one of my friends did straight away. Uh, and then Happy Valley at Slandidno. Um, there they must have gone. And then this one appeared and I knew immediately where it was uh, because in fact, that's St. George's Church on um, <clears throat> Douglas Promenade, um, where in fact they had a very bad fire um, about 10 years before this event and the bells came down. They had a set of bells there, but I won't bore you with bells. Uh, and uh, destroyed everything, it was a right mess. Uh, but here is Douglas Promenade uh, and the beach. And then um, maybe Douglas Harbour, I've got to have this confirmed yet, but I'm pretty sure it is. Um, but just what part is, I can't just identify which it is, but I think it's, it's the bit opposite um, Douglas Head. And uh, this is obviously Douglas Head, because there you have Douglas Head Ferry and Beecham's Pills, a nice little steam ferry, and uh, what must be, I think, one of the Isle of Man Steam Packing Company vessels on the left-hand side. And then um, somebody told me the other day the name of this hotel, and it's just escaped me, but I'm pretty sure Falcon's Nest, I think it was called. That's right, Falcon's Nest. And I think it might have been on Douglas Head. Uh, but uh, maybe, again, there will be somebody on who can... Uh, who can identify that for me? Just put it on the notes and we'll uh, pick it up in that way. Uh, and then this is Market Hill uh, in Douglas, um, some kind of a, of a uh, market, obviously. And then the choir group outing to Ireland. So here they are in Ireland. Don't know anything about that, but um, that must have been around about this period. And they're in some kind of pavilion here by the look of it. And then... We're not sure about this. It could be Balsha's farm or it could be Weathercock farm. I'm not certain. Uh, again, I've actually blown the, um, the, uh, uh, the date there up in, 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 and tried to find it. It's 1722, but that didn't really help me a great deal. Someone may know <clears throat> where it is, but I think it's one of the Burtdale farms within the St. John's parish. Boyd's Farm. I've never heard of Boyd's Farm. I don't know where it is, uh, and I would love to know. But um, again, it, I would imagine it must have been within St. John's um, uh, thing. And then a couple to finish with. Um, Central Station in Liverpool. And I think there's another one. Yeah, you can just see on the right hand side up here, Central Station. So that's the old Central Station. Now let's have a look at the time. Right. I'm going to do a few. Uh, of these, ah, I'm going to do a few of these miscellaneous images. Uh, uh, I'm going to run through these quite quickly because, and, and I won't be able to do them all because there's there's 50 odd. So an early photograph of again in the Atkinson of the um, opening, I think, of the um, market or one of the markets. On the left hand side is a lobster. On the right hand side or in the middle uh, are some shrimps. Uh, you can see those shrimps there. Here are the girls. I don't think they'd be dressed normally like that. Um, I think she looks like she might even be holding a crab, possibly. Don't know. <laughs> uh, and then an early one of the um, uh, firemen, the Southport firemen. And then this is a fabulous photograph. The quality is fantastic. It's a large negative. I really struggled to scan this on my flatbed scanner, negative scanner, <coughs> because I think it's nine inches by, um, by seven inches. It's Little Island, uh, and uh, it's... Uh, just let me get um, get this. Um, yeah, shows Little Island, close to where uh, Fleetwood Road is now. Uh, times must have been pretty hard for these people. The lady on the left-hand side has got a lee upon her back. And uh, if we blow it up, uh, you can actually see uh, a lot of children on the left and, and uh, there's some girls on the right-hand side and then some ladies behind. 
And there's one or two of those you wouldn't mess with. This lady here, I think if she said it was Tuesday, it'd be Tuesday, pretty certainly. And then you've got a hen here and some geese and some buildings in the back. Um, but I'm not exactly sure of the orientation of this. Obviously, all these cottages well gone. But look at the state of the roof. Just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, and there we are, just blowing up um, those photographs. Such characters, the faces. Uh, and such poverty. It's, uh, it's unthinkable in this day and age. And then uh, this photograph that was, again, in the Atkinson, uh, I had a bit of a an inkling about this, but I wasn't absolutely certain. One of the people who uh, is one of my heroes, and in fact, in the room that is now that I that I'm now in, I actually have one of his paintings, and it's actually Lawson Booth, the artist, and he was actually the mayor for a period of time, and then uh, Jeff Wright very kindly found me a photograph of um, of Lawson Booth actually in the um, mayoral chamber at Southport, and uh, there he was. I was able to match him up. And it was his son that did an awful lot of work in the Botanic Garden. And really, thanks to him, that a lot of this material survives. And just a street scene outside um, the Atkinson. It's wrong way around. I've just realised the uh, something's cafe. Is it Dobson's cafe or something? Something's cafe. I have to turn that round and read it. And then a whole box of military photographs. And this is one um, HMS Victoria's famous British aircraft carrier at sea, watched by sailors from the stern of a destroyer. And there's a whole box of these. They're absolutely fabulous quality. Uh, they must have come from the ministry. Um, just amazing photographs. And then the Premier Plunge. Uh, these young ladies, I would imagine, probably just post First World War period. Uh, I, I'm not sure we've got the angle or, or the angle looks very steep there. I mean, they hang, the, the two girls at the bottom are hanging on with their left and right arm and stopping all the others behind. But <laughs> how everybody's not sliding down, I really don't know. And what happened when uh, when they finally said, right, you can go, I just <laughs> all, all ended up in the pool. What a mess, what a mess. Anyway, and then the Holy Trinity Church about 1932 and uh, the 4200 um, uh, weight uh, bell, two ton bell being lifted into position. Doesn't look very big, but boy, is it big. And I've actually run that, um, I rung that bell with um, with Ray Woods. Now I usually at this point say, "Where do you think this is? Where do you think this is?" And uh, I know a, a couple of people have managed to get it, but uh, it's actually on the ground now that is St George's Church. So, so that's St George's Church on the left hand side on Lord Street, and where Sainsbury's is. So Sainsbury's would be roughly where this tree is on the right hand side, uh, and it's just a photograph I'd never seen before it's been given to all uh, I, I scanned it from some prints that were lent to me by Noel McQueen who very kindly said he would allow me to use these for presentations but a very early house probably 18 10 18 15 and uh, obviously in that state it's just about ready uh, in this period here which is about 1905 to be pulled down uh, you can see the state of it it's pretty grim uh, and what I'll do is I'll just run through these three or four uh, about ten I think actually um, Ainsdale Station, uh, before the road was Tarm Academy. Another, the um, platform to Liverpool. No, sorry, to Southport. Booking office, I think that is. I'm not sure which. Yeah, from Ainsdale to Southport. Yes, that's right. There we are. Lovely. <laughs> Lovely railway scene. And then uh, Orton Road. And then the corner of Orton Road and Lulworth Road. You wouldn't identify that today at all. All these buildings are gone. And then Neville Street on the corner of Bath Street. So that 40 over here where it says dinners and teas uh, is in fact um, uh, the corner of Neville Street and Bath Street. Um, that's changed so much, it's unbelievable. Just blown it up a little bit. There's so much detail in this, spectacles, from three and six, eyeglasses. Uh, and then you've got the Neville Street Picture Theatre uh, and Southport Cafe and Southport Dining Rooms and motors and cycles, tripe, hot supper rooms. I think that says hot supper rooms. All right, okay. Um, and then um, Ryland's Confectioner and Jay Holland's, whether that was Jay Holland's of Holland Toffee Phone, John Holland of Holland Toffee Phone, I'm not sure whether that was one of his early shops. 
This is on the corner of Orton Road and York Road. And it's um, the shops there that are there that have just been to, converted into flats. But uh, WWS Foreshore, a painter and direc- decorator who I knew in my childhood, um, had their um, had their offices there. Um, and there we are. That's that's his that's his that's his shop there on the left. And a saddler and somebody Jackson. Now this is, I think, is probably the only mystery that we have. I thought it might be. Uh, around about the junction of Holy Trinity with Manchester Road in that area, but I'm really not certain. Uh, it's obviously where the trams are, so it's on the tram line. But again, if anybody has any clues at all, uh, please tell me. And you can't quite read that um, that sign just by the, the gentleman who's walking along. Um, what time is it now? Uh, right, it's, it's two o'clock. So I'm just going to do a couple more and then we will... Um, We'll finish because I've 20 odd, uh, unless you want me to continue, Lee. Uh, perhaps you'll butt in if you do. But this is a photograph I scanned in um, Crosby and it's dated about 1885 because uh, Keith, Hick, Keith Hick, who is with us today, uh, in fact, identified the date as being about 1885, 86, 87, something like that, because the Cheshire Lines embankment railway and signals is there the footbridge is there the sea ball sea wall is there but in fact the marine lake south is not and you can see the royal hotel and the winter gardens and over on the right hand side are bathing uh, huts out at sea so uh, i just blow that up a little bit uh, it's a poor quality negative sadly although it's a very large negative it's um 12 inch by 12 inch i think if i remember rightly huge uh, 12 inch by 8 inch huge negative there's something going on here on the left hand side above the 3363 three, almost looks like swings or some form of entertainment. Maybe there's sort of swinging boats or something like that, you know, and then um, the seawall and then the um, then the bathing huts. But obviously no seawall and the winter gardens there on the left. Yes, this is what I was referring to. They look like you know, possibly an early amusement um, uh, for people to go and pay a few pence to, to have a go on. Right, I think probably at that stage we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bottle out because otherwise uh, I'll be going over my, uh, by, uh, by my thing. So thanks very much indeed. And I'll hand over to, uh, I'll stop the share and hand over to, uh, to Lee. <laughs> Hello, just checking, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, brilliant. Sorry, I've had proper technical issues today. My, my internet has just been rubbish. Um, so now that you can hear me, um, hi, I'm George Amblin from the Atkinson. Um, so I will quickly run through a few things while Martin's just reading the chat messages, uh, giving a chance to see if he needs to answer any questions. Um, what I should say is that Martin has been volunteering for us for many, many years now. He's done a sterling job. Um, one of the things that he has done is scanned in a load of glass negatives. And um, obviously one of the problems we have is we have all this wonderful material and it's doing something with it, getting into some kind of form that can make it accessible. And the quality of the glass negatives is just stunning. Um, in fact, many years ago, we did an exhibition which was entitled Unseen Southport. Um, basically, all we did was we used the scans, blew them up to a metre size and, um, and used them in an exhibition. And the quality was just second to none. It was absolutely stunning. So um, I will quickly run through what we've got coming up. Um, so the next object of the month talk, which is a lunchtime one, is on the 10th of March at one o'clock. Um, that talk is going to be by Dr. Laura Reese lake and Dr. Melissa Gustin. Now, this is going to be a talk about the exhibition we've got on at the Atkinson at the moment, which is the Fatal Attraction one. Um, obviously, you can't get in the seats at the moment. If you have seen it, wonderful. If you haven't and you do want to see it, if you go onto our website, we've actually scanned it in um, so you can actually do a virtual tour of the exhibition. And the talk is going to be called The Femme Fatale, From the Ancient World to the Modern Tabloid. So it's actually looking at the background story behind it because um, Laura actually co-created um, that actual exhibition. And then the next talk we have got coming up is on the 3rd of March at 7pm. And this is Dr Campbell Price and he's talking about Flinders 
Augustus Petrie on Greeks, Romans and the Egyptians. Um, so that's kind of tying in with the um, ancient Egypt collection that we have. So um, I just quickly mentioned Martin, um, May Cunliffe, she was another lady racing driver, wasn't she? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I was just reading. Uh, May Cunliffe. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. May Cunliffe. Yeah. Not. Yeah. And also Daisy Hampson, but not the yes. same Hampson. Uh, I'm still in, investigating Daisy Hampson and uh, and uh, having great difficulties finding. Uh, it was always said that she was a Southport automobilist, uh, an early Southport automobilist. Uh, I can't find. Yeah, motoristas. <laughs> motoristas. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. That was the term, wasn't it? What they coined for them. I did, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, um, did you mind to have a look at your questions? Looking at these, yes. So um, I come in here. Um, right, wait a minute. Uh, those, those headlamps, yeah. Is that a bell on top of the roof? I'm not quite sure. That was um, from Penny. Uh, I think there possibly might be, but I'm not sure. Look like it. What is the significance of the FY registration? And Jeff has answered Southport registration. What are the buildings in the distance, a uh, little, uh, little island? I wish I knew, um, because that would help us understand in which direction that photograph was taken and try to put it into perspective, but unfortunately we don't know. Belcher's Farm photograph had a round chimney, which is common in the Lake District. It might be worth looking up if there's, if nothing locally, local comes up. Thanks for that, Sue. That's interesting. Um, so Jack Holland had four retail units and the chocolate works in Ainsdale. Right, okay, I wonder who that was, J J John Holland. Um, right, let me know if you, right, okay, thank you, interesting talk. I think that's all the questions, yeah, I think that's everything. Thanks for everybody for joining us today. Yeah. Um, no doubt there's another one in the making, uh, John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just keep an eye on the website. Um, anything we've got up coming, we, we put on there. So um, just like to say thank you, Martin, as always. Wonderful and lovely to see you. And um, thank everybody for joining us today and listening to your talk. So hopefully see you all again soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.